Well, good morning and welcome to East Church. I am Pastor JT, and I hope that your soul finds a warm welcome with us here this morning. We've got another great worship service for you today as we continue our celebration of Black History Month through, uh, through song, through poetry, and through stories uh, in Sunday school with our kids. We also have uh, Lent coming up for us. And so uh, Lent begins this week on Wednesday with our Ash Wednesday worship service. Uh, we hope that you'll tune in at 7 o'clock. It'll be available on YouTube for you to watch then or sometime later, uh, whenever works best for you. We have other great uh, opportunities to connect uh, spiritually throughout Lent. So I invite you to pay attention to your email or pay attention to Facebook uh, we've got some great uh, devotional stuff coming up. We've got great uh, pieces of art to share. Uh, and we've got a whole theme that will be with us throughout the entire season of Lent for you to participate in, both at home and even an opportunity to do something uh, on your own here at the church uh, at some time uh, throughout Lent. So keep an eye on your email uh, for that. But it all starts with Ash Wednesday service at 7 o'clock uh, this Wednesday. So uh, with that in mind, let's get into our worship today and celebrate together by starting with our call to worship. Welcome to East Congregational Church. We are an open and affirming congregation. No matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here with us. The glory of God transfigures the everyday the light of God transfigures familiar faces. At the heights of our worship, may God's presence shine through the commonplace. At the depths of our pain and struggle, may God's presence give us courage and peace. May God's light shining in the face of Christ illumine all our days. Let us pray. Mighty God, stay with us always, not only in our worship, but as we share the risk and challenge of living our faith, by your powerful spirit, turn our fear into courage. Your glory shines in the face of Christ. Shine in our hearts and lives. May your name be praised, glorious God, as we pray in the name of Jesus, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Sing 
the Bible. I am not just some book that is on the back of a shelf, nor am I some book covered in dust on a table you left. You didn't even want me when I was your graduation gift, and you have no idea on how I really uplift. Why does it hurt you so much to pick up and read? Don't you realize that deep inside, I have all you need? I am like a textbook, solving your problems like you did with math. If I'm stepping on your toes, it's because you're on the wrong path. Why can't you treat me like you treat your credit cards and your cell phone? I mean, you know you've got to have them before you leave home. Tell me, when will you get the bigger picture? Just give me a chance to teach you all about the one who holds your future. I am the main purpose of helping you build a strong foundation, and I can help you learn about who is your salvation. Once you open me up and read, you will learn a lot of lessons, and no matter what battles you are facing, I'm still your secret weapon. Never mind what the gossipers say. I am the one you should be sleeping with. I can even be your medicine to be used as directed when you're feeling sick. Did you know that I'm like a cookbook with the ingredients to bake a cake? Trust me, you have no idea how good it is to your taste. I come in all various colors and sizes based on my looks. And yes, I am the book that has a grand total of 66 books. Like American and Christian flags, you should pledge your allegiance to me, God's holy word. His word is as beautiful as its own author. I am well known as a book of love, and it's just like a rose. My pages are rose petals when the beauty of his love enfolds. Unlike other books you read, it only informs you. But I'm like a mirror. I can only transform you. Now that you, I've told you everything about myself, you need to read. Don't hesitate to stop what you're doing. Pick me up, open me up, and read, regardless of what version I come in, I am your only choice of survival. And to you, I am your biggest gift, your holy Bible. Good morning. For the month of February, I will be sharing books that go along with these services. As most of you know, February is Black History Month. During our Zoom meetings, the Sunday Schoolers and I will be delving deeper into and discussing books written and illustrated by Black authors. If you would like to participate, please contact me at my email below and I will happily invite you to join us through Zoom. Our book for this week is The Dark, written by Lemony Snicket and illustrated by John Classen. If you are interested in this book, please go find the video on East Church's YouTube page. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. Listen for the word of God. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice. This is my son, the beloved Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen 
until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. Here ends the reading from the Gospel. Thanks be to God. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. There is a Please join me for a moment of prayer. Loving God, open our eyes to see what is beautiful, our minds to know what is true, and our hearts to love what is good. For Jesus' sake. Amen.
Have you ever judged a book by its cover? Well, that's a cliched question about accepting things at face value. In this instance, I I mean this question quite literally. Have you ever decided whether or not to read a book based only on what the cover looked like? I have. I once purchased purchased the book The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Haddon simply because I liked the red cover and the white lowercase letters and the the cutout image of an upside-down poodle in the middle of the cover. If the cover of the book is this cool, I told myself, the rest of it can't be that bad. Well, it turns out it was a pretty good book. It's a book that's told from the point of view of an autistic teenager, Chris, who must navigate a mystery surrounding the death of a neighbor's dog. Along the way, Chris discovers that the the truth of the world he knows is actually just a construction made by those around him to keep him safe. And soon enough, he sets out on his own, overcoming his own fears to accomplish goals he had never dreamed possible. And the book ends with Chris imagining a bright future for himself and for his family. So all in all, it's a very excellent book that can provide you a vantage point you might otherwise not know, and a beginning education on autism in the process. Now, when I picked out this book, I had my own preconceived notions of what it would be like. The artfully designed cover spoke to me of a candy-coated story that might be interesting or it might be total fluff, and I was leaning towards the latter. But I dove in anyway. And the reality of the book was much better than I thought it could be. The cover of a book doesn't tell you how good a story is or what it is fully about. It won't tell you if you will enjoy the book or not. And this cover certainly didn't tell me that this was a book about a boy with autism. It also didn't tell me that I would be able to draw upon it years later to better understand a nephew in my own family growing up with autism. And so now I see this book as a transfigured entity. From first impressions to the depth of meaning, the change of my perception of the book has been a part of what has changed me and what has been a part of my own transformation. Now, every day I see evidence of transformation around me. And it's not just my transformation, but transformation within people I come across. Transformation that is happening right now, or transformation that is years old and still echoing inside the person standing in front of me. And what I love about the idea of transformation is that it comes in unexpected times and in unexpected ways. And when we encounter that transformation in all its unexpected glory, there are a lot of emotions that come with the situation. Often the reaction to the unexpected and the unknown is fear, but if we can push past our fear, we can find something deeper, something amazing, something transformative, a moment that can reverberate throughout our lives. And the story of the transfiguration of Jesus is one of those moments. Now, I love this story. It is one of my favorite in all of the Gospels, but not for what you might think. See, 
on the surface, this is a story about the divinity of Jesus made apparent to the world in a blinding light of change. And it's a great story, very vivid in its description. But if you take your eyes off of Jesus for just a moment, you can see what I think is the heart of the story, which is the reaction of Peter. When Jesus experiences his transfiguration, Peter is unsure of how to react. Now in the story of this gospel, the week before Jesus brings Peter and James and John up on the mountain to have this unique experience, there are other stories. And we hear that Jesus had fed the 5,000 and that Jesus had healed a blind man. And these were miraculous stories that seemed too unreal for us when we read about them, and certainly they must have seemed unreal to Peter as he experienced them. I can see in Peter's mind questions, such questions that we might have ourselves. I know I said I would follow the guy, but what is this? How is this real? What is the deal with this guy? What is he doing? What is he saying? I know I followed him on my first impressions, but I'm not sure about what's beneath this surface. And so Peter has this experience, and then it transitions into Peter openly questioning Jesus' words, detailing the coming trials, suffering, and death before resurrection. And even though Peter had just called Jesus the Messiah, he still can't wrap his, wrap his head around what that means. And he tells Jesus to stop talking about all this death and resurrection stuff, and Jesus calls him out in front of all of the disciples with, with that well-known phrasing that we have heard many times, Get behind me, Satan! For you are setting your thoughts not on divine things, but on human things. As Peter was trying to better understand who Jesus was and what he was doing, Jesus scolded him in front of everyone, embarrassing him in this moment of disconnection. And so this is how Peter is taken to the mountain with James and John. Confused and dejected, he still follows as he tries to sort out what he really believes. And what Peter is experiencing is a universal questioning of faith. It's repeated many times in the Gospels, probably because we repeat it so many times in our own lives, all about our, our doubts, our questions of faith. And it's all enca encapsulated into this one moment. And then while Peter has this search for the truth on his mind, he is suddenly confronted with something that he could never imagine. There in front of him and these other two disciples, Jesus has begun to glow with a fierce brilliance. And right there next to Jesus are an equally brilliant Moses and Elijah. And all three of them are engaged in conversation with each other. In this transfiguration, the dead have been raised again to talk with Jesus. And understandably, Peter is a little bit more confused than he was a minute ago. What on earth and in heaven is going on here? He cannot believe it. He cannot believe or understand what he is seeing. And he is struck with this fear of the unknown. And so what does he do in his effort to find a grasp on reality in this moment of unreality? Well, he offers to build a place to stay for the three divine images in front of him. He wants to build a small 
shelter, to hold the, the limitless unknown of the divine. It seems pretty silly when you think about it, but, you know, I can't fault him. Because it's not like I think I could come up with anything better in that moment. That's what fear does for us. It takes out all of our rational being that we've worked our entire lives to form and support, and it throws it in a trash can for a minute, leaving us shaking in our boots and unable to think coherently. Peter was experiencing a moment of deep fear with this unknown in front of him. But he didn't have to wait too long for some help because then God shows up, proclaiming the beloved son and imploring people to listen to that son. You know, we think of it as here's this grand audience for us to see God and Jesus interacting with each other, to see this divine action happening. But the audience here is really just an audience of three. Peter and James and John. They are the only ones experiencing the sights and the sounds of this transfiguration. But to me, this moment looks particularly tailored to an audience of one. Because Peter has been trying to see the world clearly in the haze of all of the events that have recently passed. And here, here is a solution, a truth offered in the middle of this transfiguration. Listen to Jesus. And then, just as quickly as the transfiguration has started, it has ended. And now Peter, James, and John only see Jesus in front of them, and they return from the mountain with him. And though Jesus asks them not to speak of this incident to anyone, it turns out this isn't the end of the story. Because the end of the transfiguration exists in the start of the transformation of Peter. Because of this experience, Peter now sees Jesus in a new light. And if you read through the gospel, Peter isn't quick to question Jesus anymore. His faith is more solid more secure. And eventually Peter is the one who says to Jesus, well, I don't believe that I will deny you three times after your arrest. He is so sure in his faith, in his connection to Jesus. And then after Jesus has ascended into heaven and the story of the disciples continues, we find that Peter has become the leader of these disciples, truly the rock upon which the church is built, as Jesus proclaimed. This moment, this transfiguration of Jesus on the mountain, has changed Peter's life and transformed him into a true devotee of the love, peace, and justice that signify the teachings of Jesus. Now our own lives are full of these moments of transfiguration and transformation that come unexpectedly. But we need to recognize them and engage them, moments big and small, so we can see that transfiguration comes on the mountaintop. But we can also see the transfiguration comes in a book picked up at the bookstore because the cover looked neat. 
Transfiguration comes in all shapes, in all sizes, at all times of day, and always in unexpected ways. And that's because the transfiguration comes whenever and wherever God is present. The transfiguration is when God is showing us a deeper truth that better connects us to our faith. The transformation is our own when we claim that new truth and put it into practice as part of our faith. And on Peter, we find the promise of new life fulfilled beyond a transformation, a deeper connection to our faith than what is on the surface, than what the cover has shown us. And that's the transformation that changes our lives and helps us find new ways to connect with God and connect with the world and connect with each other. as we practice our faith together. Amen. come now to our time of prayer, and as we begin our time of prayer, we begin with silence for you to lift your own prayers up to God. So let us pray together. Gracious and loving God, 
You know our prayers. You know our hearts. You know what is deep, deep inside of us. And so we, as we give of ourselves to you, we ask you to hear our prayers. and transform them into love. And through that, God, we ask you to transform us, to change us, that we may continue to better reflect your kingdom in this world. That we may seek better ways to help with healing, to help with peace, to help with hope, to help with sharing, to bring abundance into our community and into this world. So all have what they need. Change us, God. Transform us to workers that are your hands and your feet that are your, your heart and your voice that are your compassion and love in this world transform us today into something new transform us into something that is you. We ask these things in your many names. Amen. You know, I had a boss that used to tell me almost every single day, the only constant in life is change. Certainly we've seen that in the last year in the midst of this pandemic where it seems like every day is something different from the last, a new change brought before us. And it can be scary to feel without that sure footing of what we know. But God reminds us that we don't have to fear the unknown. For transformation, change, this transfiguration that Jesus had in front of Peter is where new life comes from. New hope, new dreams, new spirit, new visions, new worlds. So let us not fear the transformation that is around us. And let us not fear the transformation that comes inside ourselves. So that we can transform the world into God's kingdom. Friends, our worship is over. Let our service begin. Amen. Thank you.